So I have to be honest with you, a little confession this morning. Uh, When I read the assigned text that has been given to me for today, I thought, really, Lord? Like, what have I done to Sagemont? They keep giving me these passages that are just difficult to work through. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I know most of you probably had your quiet time in this passage this week, so I might be underestimating you. But as I opened it up and started beginning reading and realizing, I mean, this passage is talking about uh, bond servants and masters or slaves and masters. And I'm like, yes, Lord, amen. Thank you for this, you know. <laughs> but I'm the kind of guy that believes every period in the Bible can be used by God. And so I think there's some lessons for you and I to learn today. I think there's some really uh, applicable moments for us in our life that we can draw from scripture today. And here's, here's what I love about how God works. Even through working through a passage like this, like God, I really want you to tell me what to say to these incredible people. And just as God would have it in his timing, actually this past weekend, I was actually standing in the streets of Ephesus just got back from a tour where I led 78 pastors and their wives on the footsteps of Paul. And just last weekend, we went and we spent a few hours in the city of Ephesus. God began to open my eyes to all that this church faced. Uh, Think about this. When you're in Ephesus, just outside the city, there's a fortress built on a hill that housed the temple of Artemis, or some would call it the temple of Diana, and, and just this, this, this incredible feeling and sense of everywhere you go in this city, there were temples that were dedicated to other people. There were statues still today in the ruins standing that would, would, uh, would highlight or would idolize certain people. And here we have this church that Paul loves so deeply that he writes this letter, and in the letter of Ephesians, then the book of Ephesians the, to this church in Ephesus, he covers a multitude of things from grace, uh, being saved by grace through faith to man living out your calling in a manner worthy of the gospel to, uh, you know, the, the scriptures we love like uh, to him who is able to do far more exceedingly and abundantly beyond all we can think, dream, or ask be the glory forever and the, husband, the, the passage on husbands and wives and how that relationships and children and parents and parents and children. And it's just a multitude of things that Paul is saying to this church. And as I stood in the streets of the ruins of Ephesus, I began to realize why Paul wrote this letter and why he covered so many various things in this letter. And here's why. Because as I stood in Ephesus, surrounded by the ruins of temples that were not of God and statues that were idols, I began to realize that this church in Ephesus were surrounded by a godless society. And what Paul was wanting to say to this church in Ephesus is simply this, guys, in the midst of a godless society, Every aspect of your life needs to point and honor Christ. In fact, I'll put it this way. My son, when he was being recruited in football, he's now at Sam Houston State. And when, uh, when he was being recruited, one of the college coaches came to our home. They ate dinner with us. And uh, after dinner and bluebell ice cream, praise God, can I get an amen? We sat down and he began to try to sell himself, uh, sell his school to us and to my son. And I'll never forget what he said because it, it, it struck a nerve with me and I've, not, I've, I've kind of made it more of a model for my own life. He said to me, he said, Caden, I want you to know if you come here, here's our motto. How you do anything is how you'll ultimately do everything. How we do anything here is how we do everything. And I think what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus in this kind of mundane detail that he is talking out in this deep dive into the lives of the Ephesians here, I think what he is saying is, hey, with a pagan, godless society surrounding you in the shadow of these secular temples, this church is growing and the gospel is advancing in Ephesus and beyond. And church, how you do anything in your life is how you will do everything. And if you will position and posture your heart and your life to do all things for Christ, then God will honor it. And so in Ephesians chapter six, Paul is gonna bring up the, 
subject of bond servants and masters, slaves and masters. The Greek word is doulos. It's a servant of a, a slave, a, a bond servant. And in the context of this, what is Paul saying? And here's how I think it can be applicable to us today, though we are not in the same uh, parameters of slaves and masters as Paul is speaking to here. Here's how I think it can apply to us today. Every single one of us in this room has some kind of level of authority in our life that we must work within the parameters of that authority in a way that honors God. And so what I think Paul is saying here is simply this. I think the theme of what Paul is saying about masters and bond servants is this. How do you serve? How do you live? How do you exhaust your life with joyful obedience? So as we dive in today, I want you to put this in the context of maybe modern day for you in the sense of your job. You're under an authority, you're in parameters. And so the question is, how do you serve with joyful obedience? So we're gonna see three things today, beginning in verse five, it says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Now let's just stop there. I want you to understand that you and I, we do not graduate beyond obedience. Now, I've got a 19 year old, he just moved out of college. Since I've been here last, in fact, we dropped him off at college and people said, well, how, how's that gone? I said, well, you know, the day we dropped him off, I mean, we cried. I mean, we didn't, my wife and I, we didn't say a word to each other for about half the trip back home. I mean, we cried, we felt like a piece of our life was gone. And then we woke up the next morning and went, this is awesome, man. <laughs> when, is, when are the rest of you going? Like, I, I mean, I've got a countdown clock to empty nesters, baby, I can't wait. Two days later, he called and said, Dad, can I come home for the weekend? I said, son, you've only been gone 48 hours. <laughs> but when I think about what's this look like, we say, okay, a 19-year-old, you know, they, they're under the parent's ruling and they leave the house. And when they leave the house and they taste freedom, all of a sudden there's this desire to be free and independent. And so they think, well, man, now I don't have to be obedient. Well... As long as I pay for your car and your car insurance and your gas and your food and your groceries, yes, you do. But here's the deal, friends. I'm 42 years old. If I was at my father's house and he said, Nathan, I need you to go do this for me. I need you to go pick this up out of the yard. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go do it. Why? Because I don't graduate beyond obedience. For many of us, spiritually speaking, we think that the more mature in Christ we become, sometimes we think we can graduate beyond the obedience of the basic things Christ tells us to do. And so what we find in this passage is listen to what he says, obey your earthly masters. This is again, bond servants and masters. He says, obey them, listen, with fear and trembling, or another word for that would be honor. How do we obey them with fear and trembling? Have you ever been in the presence of somebody that you highly respect or, or, um, or somebody that you've always wanted to meet and you walk in and you get a little nervous? You ever, you ever been in that situation, kind of get a little nervous? And you don't really know what to say. And uh, I, I was, uh, when I was a pastor, uh, a very well-known musician stopped by our church. I was his grandfather's pastor and stopped by our church. And he came in to talk to me. His grandfather was about to pass away. He wanted to come talk to me about the service. And, and this guy's known all around the world. And he walks in and my children's minister was standing there. And I had to look at her and go, like, close your mouth. You know, like, he's just a dude. But you ever been in the presence of somebody and you're just nervous, why? Because you respect them so much and you don't wanna do something wrong in that moment. Listen to me, that's I believe a word picture of what Paul is saying here when he says, obey your earthly masters, listen, with fear and trembling or with honor. So let's drill this down a little bit. Whatever circumstance in life you're in with some kind of authority, whether it be you're still at home with parents or whether it be uh, you're at college and you have professors or whether it be you're in a job and you don't like it, but you have to do it. How much honor and respect are you giving those people in authority over you? You say, well, Nathan, you don't know my boss. I don't know your boss, but Paul didn't say anything about the personality of your boss or the master. He says you as a believer in Christ, as a bond servant of Christ, as we'll see in a moment, you serve with honor and respect or with fear and trembling. And the first thing I want us to see today 
is that to walk in the joy of obedience, in joyful obedience, we must have a proper posture of the heart. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like I walk with fear and trembling. I walk with respect and honor. My son, my second son, um, he just got home late, late last night. I haven't even seen him yet. He's been on a two-week tour of playing rugby in Ireland. I've told you about him. He's redhead. He's six foot. He's massive. And he got selected for a, a, a national team to go play in Ireland for the last two weeks. When he got there, they took his phone away. And uh, he was there to train from 7 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. And they played some games. And I was just anxious to hear from him. And, and uh, only heard from him a couple of times. And, and it went really, really well, by the way. But he gets home last night and he calls me. Or he gets, he gets to Chicago last night. And he calls me. And I said, hey, buddy, how did it go? I said, dad's been missing you. I can't wait to to see you. I want to hear all about it. He was like, Dad, it was awesome. It was a great experience. And Dad, I need to apologize. I said, for what? He said, Dad, the food in Ireland was terrible. <laughs> I said, okay, well, what do you need to apologize? He said, well, I just used your credit card to buy my dinner here in Chicago. <laughs> I said, okay, well, good for you, buddy. What did you eat? He said, I found the first McDonald's I could find. <laughs> Kid you not. This is what he said, 15 years old. He said, I ate a double quarter pounder, two double cheeseburgers, a 10-piece chicken McNugget meal, a large fry, and a drink. <laughs> Y'all pray for me, man. That's what's going on in my house right there. It's good night, son. You made up for two weeks of lost time. A few weeks ago, he was in a game, and uh, they lost the game, and he called me. He was so frustrated. He said, Dad, this player didn't do this, and that player didn't do this. He didn't do this right. I said, well, son, how did you do? Well, I didn't do this right, and the coaches didn't do this right. I said, son, what are you really frustrated? Well, the coaches did this, and the coaches did that. And I said, son, who leads that team? Well, the coaches. Son, who deserves the honor and respect? I know, Dad, but if I'm not hard on myself, who's going to be hard on me? I know I shouldn't do that. I said, no, let me tell you something, son. Let me tell you a little leadership lesson. And here's what I told him. I said, leaders don't react, they respond. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, reaction is usually based off emotion. Therefore, it is consistently changing. You're consistently reacting because the emotion, emotion after emotion after emotion comes while circumstance changes. And leaders don't react because that is in a moment. Leaders respond. He said, well, how do I respond? I said, well, you, go, you go to your room tonight. You, you pray. You ask the Lord to forgive you for your attitude. And I said, tomorrow morning, you get up and you walk into that team and you tell them today, we're going to be on the same page. We're going to serve each other with honor and respect. We're going to respect our coaches, and we're going to go out there and dominate. And sure enough, they went out there and killed that team in that game. And I told him, I said, son, here's the problem. If you get in the cycle in life of constantly reacting instead of responding, then what's going to happen is you're never going to be re able to react enough because circumstances continuously change. But if you will respond by saying, I'm going to be a leader, I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to do the right thing the right way in the right time, then you go out and you're able to execute. And here's what I believe Paul is saying about fear and trembling, about respect and honor. I think Paul is saying, listen, in your relationship with your earthly master, in your obedience, do it with fear and trembling, not reacting, but responding in joy, responding in in uh, honor and respect and fear and trembling. So let's break this down maybe for your job today. By the way, I think we can all agree, every one of us has jobs that some days it's like, this is awesome. I can't believe the Lord lets me do this. And other days it's like, I can't believe you're making me do this. <laughs> I mean, anybody else? Am I the only one? Surely not. I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but Monday's coming, all right? So we're gonna all be on the same page. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is this. Sometimes our jobs, sometimes the context in which we're in authority, and it's not pleasant, it's not fun, it's not joyful, it's not something that fuels our fire. But we're, gonna, we're about to see what Paul says to do with that because when he says to serve with fear and trembling or, or, or honor and respect, the truth of the matter is we can't go throughout life constantly reacting to circumstances, but we can go throughout life responding 
with joyful obedience unto the Lord. Look at what Paul says. Okay, proper posture of the heart. How do we do that? Number one, he says, fear and trembling. Number two, he says, a sincere heart. Look what he says. Obey your masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart. Listen to this. As you would Christ. He says, not only are you to operate underneath the authority in your life as a, here he's speaking of bond servant and your earthly masters, not only are you to serve with joyful obedience by fear and trembling or honor or respect, here's what he says, you are also to serve with a sincere heart, listen to this, as you would Christ. Let's just be honest this morning. It's really easy on a Monday afternoon or a Tuesday morning to lose the sincerity of our heart when the circumstances aren't the way we want them, aren't, isn't it? When things aren't going the way we want, it is easier to lose the sincerity of a heart after God than it is to step forward in humility for the heart after God. But listen to what he says, fear and trembling, sincere heart. But there's a third way. Here's, I love this. Look what he says in verse six. As you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So here, Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus, hey, listen, this godless society is watching you. You're in the shadow of this godless society and they're watching how you do everything, including if you're a bond servant or a slave, including how you are in obedience to your masters and what is the spirit and the attitude in which you are serving and leading. And here's what he says, listen, with fear and trembling, a sincere heart. But then he's gonna say, not only that, but a right perspective. What is the right perspective? Not the way of people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, listen, doing the will of God from your heart. So what Paul reminds us here is that when our perspective is right, it's easier to walk in joyful obedience. Not when our circumstance is right, but when our perspective is right. Not when everything's just the way I want it, but when my eyes are focused on him. You see, here's what we have to understand, what Paul is opening our eyes to in this letter. That it's not those who are always watching you that you perform for, but it is bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Let me ask you this. How do you operate when no one's watching? How do you operate when you're not on the stage, when you're not in the spotlight? How are you operating? This is what Paul says, the perspective is right. What, how do we get the right perspective? Well, let's think about what you're called to do. You see, you don't have your job because you're good at it. I'm sorry. You don't have your job because that's what your degree offered you. You don't have your job because uh, you like the pay. You don't have your job because, man, you're just, uh, you're a networker, even though none of those things are bad, right? Hey, let's get the right perspective today. You wanna know why you have your job? Because there is a God in heaven who wired you a specific way and he opened the door to give you the platform for your life to be used by his glory in the calling in which in the expression in which you're living out called a job. You see, the right perspective is not, huh, man, I'm a great salesperson. I could sell a ribeye to a cow. No. <laughs> the right perspective is, I can't believe I get to be a salesperson because I'm in contact with people every single day and I get to share the gospel. The right perspective is not, well, I'm a doctor and I help people who are sick get better. No, even though I'm thankful for you, you're a doctor because you see people in their weakest moments and you can remind them that there is something greater than medicine and his name's Jesus. You're not a business owner because you've just got this incredible entrepreneurial spirit. No, you're a business owner because God's put a level of adventure in your heart for you to use that for the kingdom's sake. See, here's what I'm saying. The right, the wrong circumstance might be a job you don't like. The right perspective is God puts you there so that you may exhaust your life for his kingdom in that circumstance. So tomorrow, let's just do this together. Tomorrow when the alarm goes off, 
after two cups of Folgers or a cup of McDonald's coffee or whatever, I can't do Starbucks, man. That's like way too expensive. <laughs> after you get coffee in you, why don't you look at tomorrow and go, no, don't, don't go, oh, Lord, it's Monday. Go, oh, Lord, it's Monday, man. I got a chance with my life to make a difference this week because you have given me a platform that I don't deserve. You've given me a platform that I didn't create. You've given me a platform that I couldn't dream of to exhaust my life for your glory. Why? Because this week, God, I'm going to live with the right perspective. Think about this. Paul is talking to slaves. It's a, an oppressive calling by nature. But listen to what he says. You don't do it to please people anyways. You do it because you're a bondservant of Christ. Listen to how he parallels that. You're a bondservant to a master, earthly master, but you're also a bondservant to Christ. And listen to what he says. Doing the will of God from the heart. The right perspective. See, we can look at any circumstance and put the right perspective on it, an eternal perspective, and it changes everything. I'll give you an example. 2003, I was a youth minister. Was at a little church in East Texas. We, when I went there, we had about 15 students. When I left there, we were running about 175 students, a town of 1,500 people. God was blessing like crazy. People, students were getting saved left and right. It was just a really great season. When my wife and I began Praying, okay, God, we're about to graduate college. What do we do? I mean, we had no money. We had no debt. We had no kids. As I said, that, was, that just sounds really great when I say that out loud. <laughs> um, say, so, hey, what do we want to do? Hey, I got an idea. Let's move up to Nashville and let's start a church. Sounds good. Let's go. We packed up everything we owned in a little bitty tiny U-Haul. We drove to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We bought our first little house. 900 square feet, and um, my wife was teaching, and I was just full-time trying to figure out how to get this church going, so we went and knocked on doors. The neighbors said, hey, we're going to have a cookout at the house to meet the neighbors. They came. We gave them a gift, so we're going to start a Bible study, and so we started a Bible study in that little living room, and it grew into out of, too big for that house, so we went to somebody's double-car garage where we literally had to put carpet down because it had oil stains everywhere, and we had to push play on the CD player. For some of you students, that was before uh, I, Apple, iTunes. We put on CD player, we pushed play, and uh, we worshiped to that. God began to grow it. So we had to move out on a Sunday night to a dance studio. All you Baptists, it's a ballet dance studio, <laughs> just so you know. And um, uh, Man, before long, we had 40, 50 people coming, and we had no idea what to do. I mean, every day was, was new. In the meantime, my wife got pregnant with our first son, and she called me one day, and she said, um, I've been in a car accident. And she said, I think I'm okay, but they're taking me to the hospital. So, man, I rushed to the hospital, and by God's grace, everything um, was okay. I mean, sometimes with the way my son acts, I wonder. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, by God's grace, everything was okay. And um, yet the doctor said, hey, Jenna, um, just as far along as you are, we're a little nervous. We really think it's best for us to put you on bed rest. So she had to go to her school district and say, I've been put on bed rest. School district said, well, I'm sorry you didn't uh, stay half your, your contract, so we're terminating the contract. They said, we have no income, no insurance, a baby on the way, what do we do? I said, don't worry about it, sweetheart. I'll take care of it. I left, and I went and got a job that day and started working that day. was just trying to scrounge up everything, but the job I had um, was a sales job. Paid good if you made sales, but didn't pay insurance. And so a friend of mine was uh, a country music artist, and he was building houses on the side. And I went, I went to him. He's a friend now. I didn't know him at the time, but I went to him, and I said, man, um, anything you can do to hire me? And he said, yep. And he said, I, I can only pay you X amount per per hour, which didn't seem to make sense to me. He said, but <clears throat> what I'll do on top of that is I will pay your health insurance. Done deal. He said, you didn't even let me tell you what I'm going to hire you to do. I said, well, okay, well, what am I going to do? He said, all I got for you, man, is that you're going to have to go around these houses we're building and sweep up the floors and pick up the trash, clean it up every day after they finish working to have it ready for the next day. And so 
I said, man, I got to do what's right for my family. So I start going out there and I start picking up trash. And if I can be just really honest and vulnerable with you, <clears throat> I had a lot of conversations with the Lord as I pushed that broom across that floor. And outside was one of those big blue metal trash buckets, you know, the barrels. And I'd put trash in there and light it on fire because it got really cold in February in Tennessee. Day after day, I began to say, God, what in the world is going on, man? How did I get to this place? Like, God, I left a successful student ministry and right out of college, and God, I have so much passion. I mean, I'm telling you, I was ignorance on fire. <laughs> Better than being intelligence on ice, though, I'll tell you. I said, God, I, <clears throat> what, you know, what, what in the world's going on? Why in the world am I sitting here picking up trash? Here's what the Lord began to speaking to me. Nathan, I didn't call you here to plant a church. I called you here to plant something in you. And here's what it is. If you can't sweep the floors for my glory when nobody's watching, why should I ever put you on a stage in front of thousands of people? If the most minimal thing I can ask you to do, the most mundane thing I can ask you to do with your life is not enough to honor me and glorify me. Why would you expect for me to do something greater with your life? And listen, friends, I want to tell you something. It, I, I met a friend around that trash barrel. It's called humility. <laughs> where God just showed me that, listen, if I can't burn this trash, if I can't sweep this floor with the same joy in my life that I now get in coming to Sagemont to open the word of God, if I can't do it with the same joy and the same passion and the same enthusiasm for King Jesus, then why in the world can I expect him to do something greater in my life? And I gotta tell you, it was cold and I was alone and I listened to a lot of Dave Ramsey But can I be honest with you? I met with God a lot around that trash can barrel. It's amazing. It's sometimes it's not in a church. It's around a trash can barrel. Which God helped me put things in the right perspective. Nathan, your life is for me. This is what Paul says as a slave. Not the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You see, God wasn't ready to do something through me until he was finished doing something in me. Verse seven, rendering service with goodwill is to the Lord and not to man. So he says, fear and trembling, sincere heart, right perspective, right motives, and then right priorities. What are the priorities? Look what he says in verse seven, rendering service with a goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. So man, maybe you're in a, a context right now at your job that you just can't stand, that you just cannot stand going to work. You can't stand being under the authority of your boss. I get it. But Paul says to the church in Ephesus, as a godless society is watching, you're not really working for your boss in the big picture. You're working for the Lord. It's not for men. It's not for pleasing men. It's rendering service with a goodwill as to the Lord, not to man. And so that, that circumstance that you can't stand, that circumstance that you have a lot of tension, you go, man, I just hate this. I'm so miserable. Listen, it may not be the job description. It may be the posture of your heart right now. It may actually be that my heart is not focused on exhausting my life for the glory of God, whether I'm sweeping streets or sweeping a, a floor and burning trash or else, or if I'm a CEO, it may not matter what the job description is. It may matter where is my heart with God? Does whatever God has opened the door for me to do, am I doing it for the glory of God? Three questions, why do you do what you do? For who do you do what you do? And in what you do, are you doing it for the best of your ability to the glory of God? You see, this is one of these passages we go, well, we don't have slaves and masters. We can skip over this one. No, 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 no. How we do anything is how we do everything. And if we want to honor God to the very fiber of our beings and our life, then in every circumstance, we would have joyful obedience. So he says there's proper posture of the heart. Secondly, he says proper posture of the mind, verse eight. He says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a bondservant or is free. Paul simply says, it is a heart posture. Is my perspective right? Is everything I'm doing for the glory of God for my life? 
Is that how I'm positioning my life? And he says, it's a mind posture so that I know that when I do good, it's for the Lord and that God is watching and that God is the one that is pleased. So it's a mind posture as well. Is my mind right with, with uh, uh, knowing that as I exhaust my life for the glory of God, it's God who I am pleasing. And then he says this, it's a proper placement of respect. Look at verse nine. <clears throat> Some of you in here, you're not, in your say local work context, you are the boss. You don't get off the hook here. <laughs> Paul says, masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there's no partiality with him. So Paul simply says, if you're a servant, and you need to obey your master, do everything in your life for the glory of God. Every small thing. He says, knowing that your heart and your mind are postured. He says, if you're a master, stop threatening because God doesn't see the division of your titles. He is the master over all. And so what does it look like to live joyful obedience? Is my heart posture right? Is my mind posture right? And am I placing my respect in the right place? Now, some of you are saying, well, that sounds good, but that doesn't apply to me because maybe I'm retired. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, man, come on, brother. <laughs> 20 years and a few months for me, amen. <laughs> what I will say to you is you better worry more about what you've done for the kingdom before you expire than what you've accumulated before you retire. Yeah. So man, I, it doesn't apply to me, I've retired. No, 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 no. Why is this? Because I wanna show you a bigger picture than what Paul is saying. Paul is talking to bond servants, to slaves and their masters. Earthly, he even says earthly slaves, earthly masters. But I wanna parallel this to the gospel because there's some of you today who've come into this place and man, let's just be honest, you just, your life's a mess and you don't feel like you have hope, you don't feel like you have peace. And the truth of the matter is you go, what in the world? I, I, don't, I don't like my job, I don't like my boss, I'm not gonna like my job and my boss. Well, that's your prerogative, but if your perspective is right, that changes, but here's the deal. If you don't know the hope of Christ, you can't have the perspective of Christ. If you don't have the hope of the world, you can't have the perspective of what's after this world. And so if you're here and you don't know Christ, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you understand today that here's what Christ is saying. Paul is saying earthly masters, earthly bond servants. When you come to faith in Christ, guess what happens? You become a bond servant of Christ. Paul says in Galatians 1.10, am I now pleasing men or, or God, if I'm pleasing men, I'm not a bond servant of Christ. And see, here's the deal. When you cross the line of faith and you give your life to Christ, now Christ is your master and you are a bond servant of Christ. And so you never graduate beyond being the master servant relationship. In your workplace, there is a master, a boss, a authority, and you are a servant and showing them how to do that in a way that honors Christ. In your spiritual life, there is a master, a, a, uh, 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 an authority. And when you're in Christ, listen to me, he is your master and you have the greatest privilege of your life being a bondservant for Jesus Christ. So it parallels in our life spiritually as well as in the reality of day to day to say, all right, well, wait a second, how am I the greatest bondservant for Christ? with the proper posture of the heart, with the proper posture of the mind, and with the proper placement of respect. Jesus is our master. He is our boss. We have the privilege of serving him. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you've never crossed that line of faith, here's what I want you to know. There is so much hope for you in Jesus. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've faced, Jesus loves you where you are. But listen to me, friend, he loves you too much to leave you there. 
I stood in city upon city upon city last week in which we read about in the New Testament of churches that thrived and the gospel began to expand. And these guys were rebels, man. They were, they were standing up for the things of God in a godless society. And, and uh, the church began to rapidly increase. And it was people after people after people giving their life to Christ and it increasing. And I stood there and I thought to myself, man, this thing is still expanding in Sagemont. We are beneficiaries today of those churches back then standing firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ, realizing that he is our master and we are his servants. And if you're here today, friends, I want you to hear me. I, I am, I'm about to lose my voice as you can't tell. I've done a lot of talking over the last two weeks. But I'm begging you with every fiber of my being, if you're here today and you've never crossed that line and given your life to Christ, listen to me, friends. There is then an authority in your life. He's called the enemy. And the Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's got you wrapped up in its web of his lies saying you're not good enough. You, you, you've done too many bad things for God to love you. And it's a lie straight from the pits of hell itself. There is a Christ who loves you so. There is a God we've sang about that says you can't outrun the grip of his grace. You can't go too far where his love can't find you and you can't do anything that his grace can't forgive. And today, man, if you're here and you say, Nathan, I want that hope. I'm so tired of my life feeling like there's no hope and there's no peace. The man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you and challenge you to be bold. Take that step of faith and say, man, I wanna make Jesus Lord of my life, savior, boss, master. And I wanna get my priorities in life right and I want to follow him. So Nathan, how do I do that? In just a moment, we're gonna have a time of response. I'm gonna be standing down front, man. I will talk to you and pray with you if you're just coming and, and come up to me while we're singing or afterwards, man, I'd love to just talk with you. But I'm begging you with every fiber of my being. I'm so fired up about the gospel after I've been there and seen that thousands and thousands of years go by and the gospel still advance. I'm so fired up that the gospel is so real in our lives and Jesus has changed our lives. And I don't want anyone that I come in contact with not to hear the gospel and not to have the chance to respond to Jesus. So I'm asking you to come to me. There'll be others up front you can come speak to or you can go to the Connection Center. Whatever that looks like, man, please don't leave this place with that unsettledness in your heart and your spirit. When God is calling you to himself, he is meeting you right where you are. And man, I'm telling you, his grace is sufficient for you no matter what you've done. And the rest of you, man, these altars will be open. Maybe there's a work situation. You're like, I haven't been honoring the Lord. Man, I want to just come and repent before the Lord and say, God, I want the right perspective. Maybe there's coworkers you need to come pray for that need to come to know Christ. Maybe you need to go to, before them boldly with the gospel. Whatever God's saying to you, man, would you be faithful to respond today? We won't tarry long, but I believe in giving people the chance to respond when Christ is speaking, when the Holy Spirit's drawing you in. So, Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, you'd give boldness to those who really want to come to know you. God, they're holding on. The enemy is fighting their mind right now, but they're holding on. But God, would you just simply remind them that the enemy is a liar and that there is life in you. Father, I pray all over this place that there's people who, man, they've just not been living in a way that honors you in the workplace. God, today they would just come to a place going, no, 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 man, I want to reset my life, my priorities, and I wanna be able to shine the light of the gospel every day where God's called me and opened the opportunity. Father, would you move in this time in Jesus' name.